we'll go to the second model, 2.1, molecular weight determination. This has to do with, uh, you know, systems, properties of a system. And of course, using these properties of a system, the colligative properties, we can determine molecular weight of substances. And we'll shortly see these different types of uh, properties and colligative properties. Okay, the outline will simply look at systems, we'll look at colligative properties, we'll look at two statements of Rao's law, we're here again with Rao's law, and the use of Rao's law in calculating relative molecular mass, and we'll look at elevation or boiling point, and of course a bluescopic definition. Now, when we talk about system, is for us to demarcate a space or region where we're taking a specific reaction. For instance, in a class where we are, that class can be our system. If we decide to classify that class our system, then that means we're not interested in, in what is happening you know, around the university. Our interest is within that class. This is a chemistry course, so whatever is happening in the chemistry course is our interest. We're not interested in what is happening in economics, you know, business, or even another science class, course. Now, there are types of systems. Basically, we're looking at just open and closed systems. There are still other. For instance, we still have an isolated system. But our interest is open, open system and closed. We say open systems are where the reactants are influenced by external conditions or external bodies, e.g. external conditions of atmospheric pressure. Whereas a closed system, they are not affected by external conditions. For instance, if in the class, once I enter the class, I close the door, nobody comes in, nobody leaves. And every other thing happening around the, the university is not disturbing us. Then we can approximate that to a, clo an, a closed system. But if I enter the class and allow the doors open, and students can walk in and out, then it's an open system because even the people coming in and going out can distract us. That means the system is open. Even somebody who is not a member of the class can walk in because it's an open system. Now, there are three types of properties of a system. One is additive or extensive, just like the type goes, properties that result to summation, just like mass, masses of two objects will make up, you know, total mass. We have constitutive, we we'll call it intensive. Constitutive means constitution. That is, depends on the arrangement of the molecules of that system. But the one that is of interest to us is colligative properties. And this is a property of a system that depends only on the concentration of the particles or molecules that make up. For example, pressure of a gas depends on the molecules of that gas. So we're interested in colligative properties of a system. And these colligative properties, we are going to be looking at non-volatile solids dissolving volatile solvents. And based on that, we have four colligative properties. Lowering of vapor pressure, elevation of boiling point, depression of freezing point, and of course, osmotic pressure. We are going to break this down. In this particular model, we we'll look at two of them, and then the next model, we we'll look at the remaining two. So the first is lowering of vapor pressure. If we dissolve a non-volatile solid or solid in a solvent, we discover that the pure vapor pressure is lowered. You know, remember when we talked about vaporization and boiling. So dissolving a non-volatile solid, the vapor pressure about the solution is less than the vapor pressure above the solvent. So P is the vapor pressure of the solution, where P is soft, uh, superscript zero, is the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So there is lowering. Therefore, lowering of vapor pressure is proportional to the vapor pressure of pure solvent. Therefore, we can use this, and Raoul's calculated that the relative lowering of vapor pressure, what we call the relative lowering of vapor pressure is P0 minus P divided by P0 is equal to X2. And this X2 from equation 2 here is 
the mole fraction of the solid. So we can now state a second Rouse law. It says Rouse law states that the vapor pressure of a solution is equal to the product of the pure vapor pressure and the mole fraction. We've met this previously. Or the second statement of Rouse law says that the relative lowering of vapor pressure is equal to the mole fraction of the solid. So these two statements of Rouse law tells us about Rouse law. That's what we have looked at here, two statements of Rouse law. Look at the first statement, P0 minus P over P0, which is the relative lowering of vapor pressure is equal to the mole fraction of the solid. We will now use this and make our calculations. Mole fraction N2 over N1 plus N2. But we know that X1 plus X2, we made that note, that the sum of the mole fractions of the constituents is always equal to 1. So X1 plus X2, X1 is your solvent, X2 is your solid, it must be equal to 1. But then we define X1 and also X2. So we substitute X1 plus X2. So which means instead of writing relative line of vapor pressure is equal to X2, we write 1 minus X1. And we'll solve and we'll arrive at P equal to P0 X1. This is the first statement of Raoult's law. So we've been able to prove this first statement from the second statement of Raoult's law. Now, you can use Rouse law to calculate the relative molecular mass. And that's what we've quoted here. P0 minus P over P0 is equal to X2. And one condition to use this is that the solution will be very, very dilute. Remember, we also said that for us to apply ideal solution, that it must be very dilute solution. So when we now substitute for the values of N1, of course, when we say it's very dilute, then it means that N1 plus N2 will be approximately equal to N1. So we'll now use this equation and solve, and we'll get equation 4, which is what we can use to get M2. Once we're able to measure the relative lowering of vapor pressure, that is P0 minus P over P0, we know the weight of the solute, we know the weight of the solvent, we do molar mass of the solvent. We can calculate the molar mass of that particular solute that is dissolved there. But we must note that this is not a very popular method of determining relative molecular mass because relative lowering of vapor pressure or lowering of vapor pressure is usually very small and cannot be measured accurately. So once you have an error in this vapor pressure or relative lowering of vapor pressure, automatically the result we'll get will not be accurate result. Solved an example here. Look at it. The question is here. The solution we substitute and we'll get the molecular mass of a solid. Just pause the video, take a piece of paper and check what was done and you will understand the now, the next is elevation of boiling point. Now, generally, when the vapor pressure is lower, then it means that we must heat that solution again to a higher temperature. That means the boiling point has been elevated or increased. I will have a general agreement. The difference between boiling point of solution and the pure solvent at any given constant pressure the fact is referred to as a boiling point elevation. We represent the boiling point elevation as delta T. And we're saying that delta T is directly proportional to X2. That's the mole fraction of the solid. And the constant of proportionality there is K subscript E, which we call a biloscopic constant. Using the sentence X2, like we use in lowering of vapor pressure, will be W2M1 divided by M2W1. We can use equation 6 here. Once we're able to measure the elevation of boiling point, we can use this equation to find the relative molecular mass of the 
solids. Here, we just try to define that ebullioscopic constant. We say ebullioscopic definition. And using equation 7, we can calculate the ebullioscopic constant. But in most cases, it is given. But why it is not given, then we can use this equation to calculate it. And to ensure accurate, you know, determination of relative molecular mass, these conditions must follow. Accurate measurement of delta T, we must avoid fluctuations in temperature readings and avoid superheating of the apparatus. Of course, there are limitations of this boiling point metal. And these limitations are that there can be, it cannot be applied when solute and solvent react chemically. Remember, we are dealing with uh, solutions, not compounds. When ionic dissociation occurs, when solutions are concentrated, we say it must be dilute solution. The dissolved solvent must be non-volatile. If you are using a volatile dissolved uh, solid, then this will not work. So these are the limitations of the boiling point method. We'll have another example. All the things given are specified here. We now substitute and we're able to get M2, you know, illustrating the boiling point elevation. Here we are giving Ke. So if we are not giving Ke, we can calculate using that equation 7 that I gave you before. Okay, in this example, we have used that equation to calculate Ke. Although Ke is giving 0 0.52, we have calculated our Ke as 0 0.51, which is approximately the same. And then, first question, we use Rao's law, relative line of vapor pressure, and we're able to calculate the vapor pressure of the solution. And the second one, we use the elevation of boiling point, and we're able to calculate the boiling point of the solution. The conclusion of this module, we have looked at systems, types and properties, we have looked at colligative properties, lowering of vapor pressure, and also elevation of boiling point. And we looked at the two statements of Rao's law, we looked at a bioscopic definition, and of course some illustration. Thank you very much for listening and see you in the next class.